Well, as a Cincinnati native, I will welcome you to Cincinnati, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yesterday, we got to hang out. Um, I took her to Evanston and also King's Records. We were, we were supposed to take our guests to a place that was special to us. Um, and the city of Cincinnati has invested a lot within that King's Records recently, um, and it's something that's important to me and my family. And so I wanted to show that part of Cincinnati to Sean. Um, thank you for doing that. So welcome to thank Cincinnati. You. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, one of the things as we were um, visiting those places, one of the things that stood out to me was um, the closeness uh, between the, the different communities and how drastically the uh, value of the land and the value of the home seemed to change. And to hear you um, talk about that, mm -hmm. you know, and talk about um, why it is the communities decided to save King Records, right, um, really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, do you want to share a little bit about well, like, who you are and like why Sure. This community, why you choose to continue to work in Cincinnati? Sure. Work so, for Cincinnati's I, people? Yes. Okay. So I am um, born and raised in Cincinnati. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Walnut Hills High School mm -hmm. because okay. when, you, <laughs> when you're from Cincinnati, you have to tell, you have to say, like, what high school you went to. So, of course, why not? Mm -hmm. um, but I do have a, I have a deep love for Cincinnati. I've been at the city now for 12 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I started in economic development. And so I think Cincinnati is an awesome place with a beautiful fabric of neighborhoods. We have 52 different neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And being at the city for so long, I know exactly when we leave one neighborhood and go into the other. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's so eclectic and um, it's just a place that I call home. My husband is not from Cincinnati. He's from Atlanta. He moved okay. here about 15 years or so ago, mm -hmm. um, and he loves it as well. He's been embraced by the community here. Um, and so for me to do this work in economic inclusion, um, previously with economic development, mm -hmm. it's really helping to push our minority women, small businesses, the people who make Cincinnati so great. And anything that I can do to help that and mm -hmm. help foster that is what I'm here for. I love it. So um, it's something that I hold dear to my heart and anything that I can do to help, I love this position because it puts me in that place where I can actually work with individuals, find them resources, um, and help push the needle, not only for them, but for our city. Hmm. That's beautiful. Um, and that's important to me. That's beautiful, that's powerful. You know, it reminds me of, to, to my uh, fellow Chicago neighbors out here, um, it reminds me of the power of our community and like how, how powerful it is to get to work at home, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, I'm uh, originally from South Side of Chicago, as you heard in the introduction, and I currently work for the city of Minneapolis. And people always say like, oh, when are you gonna go home? And I would say, well, like, I'm kind of a person of two homes, yeah. right? And um, before I make the transition back to Chicago, it was very important to me mm -hmm. that I give to Minneapolis where um, um, people have really contributed to my mm -hmm. uh, sense of self, uh, my understanding of community, and really grounded me in the value of putting community at the mm -hmm. forefront of economic development. Mm -hmm. And I have, you know, riding around, I was kind of like, oh, well, it's interesting to me to see a home that's maybe valued at a million dollars and it's made of stucco. And then to be in an area where it's brick. Like brownstones, like beautiful yes! brownstones. And it's like $100,000. And I thought to myself, well, my people probably live in the brownstone, right? Like Probably. 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 Like at a, at a level of thinking about building materials, that property is actually worth much more. Much more love and mm -hmm. craftsmanship and skill was put into crafting that and time, just the contribution mm -hmm. of time. And so I always carry with me, especially from Chicago and, and from our residents in Minneapolis, um, and I think Mia, touched, Mia Songbird touched on this yesterday, really focused on this yesterday, this piece about retelling our truth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And like what that means in terms of economic inclusion. And mm -hmm. for us in the city of Minneapolis, economic inclusion is about specific solutions to specific harms mm -hmm. and about making sure that the pre people who have really carried the brunt of the load for this country actually see a return on the benefit and are at the forefront of the decision-making process. And a lot of people say, oh, well, that means we're gonna invite them to a meeting. No, we don't, we're not inviting you to a meeting. We want you to be in the investment group, mm -hmm. right? We want you to be the owners of the cooperatives. We want you to be the recipients of our contracts and that sort of work. Um, 
So I was thinking about just like what it means for us now because we're in government 12 years, 12 years, right? 12 years in one city structure. Yes. I've been with the mayor for two years, I'm about 16 years um, into economic development now. And economic inclusion, I always say, is it's like the latest buzzword, buzz phrase it's for some people. In economic inclusion and equity. Yeah, exactly. It used Those to be multiculturalism. Yes. Sometimes we hear yes. diversity. Yes. So what does economic inclusion really mean for you in your work, in your life? For the city, mm -hmm. um, this is something that is fairly new. So my role did not exist seven years ago. Mm -hmm. It was created in 2016. Um, diversity can mean a lot of things for a lot of different people in Cincinnati, and economic inclusion most definitely means a lot of things to a lot of different people in Cincinnati. But to the city, we put our money we put our money up to um, to go through a disparity study. Mm, okay. And that was over years of minority and women-owned businesses saying, the city is not working with us, they are not procuring with us, we're here, how come we can't get a city contract? Mm -hmm. And so a disparity study is no small feat. The city spent about a million dollars to undergo a disparity study, which is something that's really important to us because the data in that disparity study allows for us to have race and gender specific programs. Mm -hmm. Without that, we would be open to challenges, legal challenges. And so in 2015, mm -hmm. this is all still fairly recent. Right. In 2015, there was a group of about 80 business owners that came together with the mayor's office and our city manager at the time. And they made the decision that while we were undergoing this disparity study, which is really just a, a review of all of our city purchasing um, history over a period of years, they made the choice that they were going to work together. And regardless of what came out of that disparity study, mm -hmm. they were going to put forth the work and the plan mm -hmm. that for Cincinnati, specifically the city of Cincinnati, how do we move ourselves in a different position in which we are actively engaging minority and women in small businesses? And that was huge for us. Mm -hmm. um, in 2015, the disparity study came out, and surprise, there was a disparity. Mm. Um, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> yeah, so who, who, who would have thought? Um, <laughs> So for us, it was more of like, okay, let's put this plan now into action. And what does that take? Right. And I think right. that kind of goes to our daring question Absolutely. of, we now have all this information, and what does that mean Absolutely. to us? And at the city at the time, it meant let's create a department of economic inclusion. Mm -hmm. Let's put forth programs and plans that are race and gender specific. And let's put forth the structure that's needed to push this forward. Mm -hmm. And so for us at the city, economic inclusion means how do we include more minority women and small businesses? And that is very specific mm -hmm. in who we buy our goods and services from. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, we had to completely change the way that we buy goods and services. Mm -hmm. We had to realign our city purchasing department. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the city, that's what that meant. And how can we grow those numbers? Um, I think we've transitioned a little bit just from growing those numbers to understand how we can help businesses sustain mm -hmm. this growth. Because now what we see is we're understanding where these gaps are because we're so much, we're aware of who we're including and who we're not including. Right. And so for the city, I think it can mean a lot of different things, but my, my goal and my position is how do we create more opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses specifically at the city? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we're righting the wrongs of many, many years where the city was an active, it was a passive participant of discrimination. That was mm -hmm. actually one of the, um, it was the in findings, the disparity yeah. study, one of the findings, mm -hmm. was that we were a passive participant we kind of, it was going on, mm -hmm. we didn't do anything mm -hmm. to stop it, but the structure that kind of helped to harbor that, we, we were passive in how we handled it. And so since 2016, we've been very aggressive in who are we contracting with? We're setting mandatory subcontracting goals on certain procurements, over $50,000. It's very, very specific mm -hmm. in how we handle that. Mm -hmm. And I think as a city, that's really helped us move that needle because we have some type of in intentional 
aspect of how we're moving this forward, and that's our definition of economic inclusion. That's huge. So that's huge for Minneapolis. For Minneapolis, what does well, I think that mean? you know we've had our disparity study done mm -hmm. um, in 2017. Was our last one. We were preparing for the next disparity study, and our context is that we we exist in a uh, self-identified mm -hmm. liberal community, right? So yeah. I would say that we have incredible people in Minneapolis and in the Minneapolis-St. Paul region, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people know the rhetoric, right? Mm -hmm. We know how to tell the story of being progressive. We know how to tell the story of being race conscious, and oftentimes when it would get down to specific policy making, um, people get hesitant. Mm -hmm. You know, very, very like, oh, but maybe that's too fast, and what if everyone isn't, you know, on the same page? And and so um, in the last couple of years. It's been a couple of years now. In the last couple of years, we've really focused on um, going back to the root, to the root. So the root is to acknowledge that everything that we all do mm -hmm. is on stolen land, hmm. right? Like we took the land from the mm -hmm. native folks who are here who are now sovereign nations. And we have to be honest about that. And that means that we talk a lot about data. Actually, they won't show up in the data because of the racist, xenophobic, mm -hmm. Um, policies and practices that were enacted on that community so their their population has decreased um, we have to be specific about mm -hmm. who built this country so American descendants of slaves ADOS as some people know built this nation that's specific right and then we have systems that have whether it's racially restrictive covenants if you look up mapping prejudice mm -hmm. in Minneapolis we have a lot of work done on that um, if it's redlining, uh, which still impacts our system today, and the list goes on of policies, restrictive licensing, et cetera, um, we know that black people, specifically African Americans, were intentionally targeted and locked out of the system. And so instead of having conversations that would suggest that we just need to do more to get particularly black and native folks to participate in the current system, we really focus on changing the system. Mm -hmm. That is to say, if you are a part of those groups, and many others, but if you're a part of those groups to start, we believe that you are owed a return on your investment that you've made to the city and to the country, mm -hmm. period. To begin with on the procurement side, which is interesting because it, it is internal, mm -hmm. right? We really yeah, focus on, it, on the internal. It's been about six years of work now in this, um, and we've really started to move it a lot faster in the last two years. We focus on the internal because we can't say to our business partners, which we often do, we can't say to the other, other public sector entities, we expect you to behave differently if we don't. Mm -hmm. And so we have gone through this really interesting process of, of identifying the groups that are mm -hmm. really locked out of the system. Um, surprise, still black people. Even for us. Even, yeah, Even right. for C Cincinnati, our Same definition thing. of minority is African American. See, and, and that in some ways, we need to get to that level of specificity mm -hmm. in our definitions, mm -hmm. right? So we did that work, and then we found out, to your point about changing the system, that in fact, we didn't catalog our vendors ac ac accordingly. Mm -hmm. And so we have a citywide goal now of 30%. I think you all have a 30%? We have a 17% uh, MBE, 10% mm -hmm. WBE program goals. Okay, perfect. So, so almost 30. Right, so we have a 30 wide, it's new, like within the last few months, new 30% goal. And what we're working toward is establishing department level spend goals, which is a whole thing. But if you can imagine your planning yes. and economic development department, your public works department, the people who do the roads, deal yes. with the buildings, negotiate all your major business contracts, having a goal of not just the spend for paper clips and paper, but also the spend for the cement, mm -hmm. for the contracts to be the developers on your own buildings, mm -hmm. to have like a, a goal in each department that identifies um, what our level of availability is, and then basically says to department heads and to city staff, we're gonna hold you accountable mm -hmm. in your review process to meeting those goals. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a tense thing, right? Because it we is. haven't been this race conscious in our country, let alone our city. And, and imagine what that looks like to change yeah. the habits. I mean, and really this is, it's institutionalized. Absolutely. These are, these are policies that we put forth, and even for the city, when Absolutely. we changed city purchasing, mm -hmm. there was there was an issue of well, it already may take you know a month to get something through, yes. and now you're adding a mandatory meeting to discuss who we're working with, who's on that evaluation panel, and how much money, um, and that was huge for us. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes from the leadership to say like this is a priority. I think at the city, mm -hmm. for us, it was the right time where. There was no excuses for that. I Absolutely. mean, it was, this is what we have to do. And if it's going to take now a week and two days, then you need to get it in 
a little bit sooner to <laughs> we accommodate can two days that. earlier, right? Um, <laughs> but it was it's something about how are we very intentional about mm. that and how do we hold people accountable? And even for the city, um, my office is charged with actually setting and establishing the goals. Mm -hmm. And we did that because previously the certain there were certain rules and regulations that allowed for a certain spin mm -hmm. to be had amongst different departments, mm -hmm. but it also wasn't reviewed. And so it opened up opportunities for the same contractors getting the same contracts year after year. And so for us, we looked at that and said, well, we need to, how do we fix that? Mm -hmm. And it was, let's centralize this. Let's have one group of people looking at this, every single thing. And even mm -hmm. to this day, and this has probably been about three or four weeks, three or four years, um, every week, the city manager, me, all of the assistant city managers and the procurement agent, we sit in a meeting and we go over every single bid, RFP, request for proposals, request for qualifications, and we talk about what's the inclusion goal? Mm -hmm. How much is this? Who was the incumbent? Mm -hmm. And it's that type of deliberate engagement um, that we've seen at the city of, of really how do we may hold ourselves accountable for trying to meet that 27% Absolutely. goal. Absolutely. Um, and so I'm just, I'm very interested when you talk about Minneapolis because mm -hmm. we have kind of, we're, we're now in that second phase of we're looking at all the information and the data that we've collected from doing that. Um, and so it's always curious for me when I hear other cities talking about how they're initiating some of those best efforts mm -hmm. because I do agree with you. It's about accountability. How do you hold yourselves accountable? Absolutely. And it's, it's similar to what you're doing. We've we have uh, your work lives in our Department of Civil Rights primarily, mm -hmm. and then in our procurement office, which is actually in our city coordinator's office. So it's it's um, it's split up, and we started to convene those folks together mm -hmm. with our division of race and equity and others to get down to the level of not just what is the contract, but what is the system. Mm -hmm. What are the processes that we make our businesses go through when they want to get to get into what we have as a target market program and those sorts of things. And then we're having conversations about national best practices. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we know nationally is that it's recommended that you actually don't split contracting by minorities and women because when that mm -hmm. happens white women tend to get the contracts mm -hmm. 70 percent 80 percent 90 percent and it's not bad but if women are the minority then women are in the minority group and let's mm -hmm. just call it minority and then compete at that level right so what we've done in our we just passed our first ever racial equity action plan at the city oh, wow. which is wow. huge for us huge. Um, and we didn't just pass a set of values but we really said uh, we're going to grow black, indigenous, people of color owned businesses in the city, and we're going to do it in these four ways, and then we have metrics attached to them, and then we have a requirement that our departments actually update on that goal. That was going to be the question that I asked you about mm -hmm. the, your racial equity work in Minneapolis. Yeah. Um, it's in everything that we do, and it doesn't mean that we um, have reached the place where we think that we're great and we're sort of maintaining a beautiful status, but increasingly um, we are just like, it's a non-negotiable. So we're rolling out uh, the first ever racial equity impact assessment to be integrated within our legislative information management system, which is where um, all of the requests for actions go to city council. So one of the things that we're figuring out is like, you know, how do you apply this? And we're thinking that if you're gonna spend city money, mm -hmm. then you need to go through a racial equity impact mm -hmm. assessment. And so now before you can request, what we're working on is that before you can request that city council would take any action that would then go to the mayor, that you actually do a racial equity impact assessment. Mm -hmm. So when your request goes through, city council will see mm -hmm. if you said, oh, I didn't look at the data, I'm not really sure, I'll have to get back, and then they can ask you the question or say, thank you for requesting it, that go on our agenda, we're not gonna do it until you go ahead and complete mm -hmm. that racial e equity impact assessment. How has that been, ex how has that been received? Received, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Just as you might imagine. <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny, we have, I think we're in a moment in the cities and in the state. Um, certainly, one of the things I love about working with Mayor Fry is that he's outcome oriented mm -hmm. and technically proficient. And I think it's rare that you get both from someone who like really loves just being mayor mm -hmm. and it makes a difference and he's respected, mm -hmm. so that's helpful. Our city council members are also really justice oriented right now and so there's this moment at the city where the elected body mm -hmm. isn't um, sort of just rhetoric heavy mm -hmm. but is action driven at some level mm -hmm. 
So that helps. It, I think it stresses our staff out sometimes. Not just, um, I don't know that it's a resistance on their part, but I think that they have a lot to do. We are the largest city in the state of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We have, in our region, um, people of color are projected to grow at 119% over hmm. 30 years. Okay. People who are not of color are projected to grow at 9%. So, so people are dealing with not a theoretical change mm -hmm. in reality, but a, a, an impending rapid shift mm -hmm. in our culture um, and our structures are antiquated. Mm -hmm. So I think that people are ecstatic about the values. I think that people are impatient about the product. And, um, and, I, and I think at a community level, we are in a transition phase. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, you know, I was, we were talking, we were all talking yesterday, and one of the projects I mentioned is the Upper Harbor Terminal. It's a 48-acre redevelopment along the Mississippi River. Um, in 1935, the city of Minneapolis had a map that labeled North Minneapolis, which is where this project is, as a Negro slum. Hmm. 1935. Okay. Now, there's some debate about if that was prescriptive or descriptive, but at any rate, you labeled it a Negro slum. Mm -hmm. And now, it is not by happenstance the majority African-American community mm -hmm. in our city. And so while we're moving forward with this project, this 48-acre redevelopment project, um, I think we're seeing a microcosm of the rest of the country where residents really are the powerhouse. And they've been saying to the city, we want you to be serious about this contracting with our people, mm -hmm. right? We want you to create jobs that we can hold. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about affordability, we're not talking about area median income for the, for the, um, for the region. Mm -hmm. We want you to talk about our neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? Like we want a solution so that when this project is put in place, we don't end up getting pushed out to the suburbs mm -hmm. or getting pushed out to another state because now rents are $2,000 a month. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have an elected body and we have staff, frankly, mm -hmm. who are bringing their skills to bear and are bringing their passion and commitment to bear. And so we are a little bit in that, in that storming phase where I think the residents are at a place where they're like, oh, but can we trust you government finally? Hmm. Can we trust you after 400 years of you failing to keep your promises? Mm -hmm. And we're saying yes, and they're saying show us, and we're saying it's mm -hmm. like here's step one, right? Mm -hmm. Move at the rate of trust. I think that's on our, yeah. one of our um, signs in the room. Yes. And, and yet they're saying, but insulate us now, and the private market is taking over. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just that, that tension of being government and having well-intentioned tension people, at least for the moment, right? Like who we vote for matters. Mm -hmm. um, who you support getting appointed matters. I'm an appointee, matters. there are a few others. Yeah. Um, and the reality that for 400 years, for 400 plus years, 400 that we count, mm -hmm. this country has failed to keep its promise to the very people that we're trying to develop with. I think that is, that's a key thing when we talk about economic development. Mm -hmm. And for the city that has been, while we have really progressed within how we look at minority and women um, inclusion related to city procurements, mm -hmm. there's a whole other economic development world out there. Mm -hmm. And how do we work with those developers and hold them accountable, yes. not only to include minority and women-owned businesses on those um, construction contracts, Absolutely. but to have workforce goals. Absolutely. And we've had, I think we've had some tremendous developer, developers in our community mm -hmm. who have committed even to aspirational goals in some of our city contracts to say, we're willing to step out there. We want you to hold us accountable. We're going to report our subcontractor spend because this is important. Mm -hmm. And I think it's those t steps of people coming in and seeing people who look like them work um, and own businesses that are um, contributing to the construction of that. Um, but that's been a way um, that we've looked into how do we work with those developers mm -hmm. in getting that minority women participation. And it's, it's critical, and I think you, you raise a, an important point too on this economic inclusion and economic development side, mm -hmm. and it's ownership. It is. So that procurement is one step, workforce is one step, but I think ultimately the way you think about Black Wall Street, you think about the Chicano movement, you think about any of the points at which black and brown people have survived and thrived in this country, and we did it outside of the system. Mm -hmm. And so the other piece that we're really focused on is making sure that as city, mm -hmm. we're investing in people as owners, as entrepreneurs, as technologists, as innovators, as really, I mean, the folks who've contributed mm -hmm. already, but saying, we wanna figure out, if you can't write the check for the building, like that's, that's the outcome of racist policies. You can't write the check for the building, so we want to make sure that we can figure out a way to write down the land so that you can get access or that somebody can mm -hmm. 
sort of shepherd that process and honor the contributions that have been made. Mm -hmm. But ownership is key to inclusion. It is. Yeah. I agree. So I think we're getting the we're, we're getting the I one think we're minute. Getting the boot. <laughs> <laughs> is there so Cincinnati? Incredible work so far. Thirty seconds of something that you feel people should know or like word of motivation. I think Cincinnati is on the move. We are open for business. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a new, fairly new city manager, um, and we are invested in making sure that our businesses are not only thriving but are are being sustained. Um, we, we know that we can't do it all, and so we have great partners, and we want to foster those partnerships, relate relationships. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's a different day here. I mean, mm -hmm. it's very different, um, and, it's, and it's eclectic, and I think it's a great vibe, and I think we have some amazing partners that help us move this needle That's forward. Perfect. I love it. How about you? Yeah. Um, Minneapolis is amazing. Uh, you know, long time coming when you're ready to start your idea to scale it, yeah. um, bring it to us because you have a team of people who are ready to move it forward. And I think for all of us who are our community, go out, own your government, do not let people push you to the side or tell you that you can't be there. Mm -hmm. If that means showing up every single day, showing up people's fundraisers, and then be ready to pivot when you find somebody who says, I believe in you and I'm willing to invest mm -hmm. in your idea and also save your intellectual property. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.